Okay, so admit all. So, hello and welcome. Can everybody hear me? Can I have some thumbs up in the Great, thanks, Prangeli. Um, so, I just wanted to introduce you again for the last day of our Learning Landscape Symposium. And for anyone who hasn't been here the last few days, we've had a wonderful lineup of speakers. Um, the Learning Landscape, you know, we usually have it every year in Canberra, and it's just usually a really great, uplifting experience, both. Um, from someone who's worked at it and also just attended it. Um, so 2020 would have been the 20 or the ninth year of the learning landscape and it was due to be organized for March um, and had to be sadly canceled. However, we have kind of gone a different way and done an online thing this year and it has been working brilliantly. So, um, you know, I just think it's been a great event of kind of um, a gathering of place-based outdoor environmental educators teachers, community activists, citizens, and we've had people from all over Ireland and we have had so, so many international attendees this year, which is really gratifying and really, um, it's just really interesting and it's, it's great for us. So we're delighted today to have Shane Casey. Um, at 12.30, we have um, Paddy Madden and Des Murta. Um, and before I introduce you to Shane, I just want to acknowledge our sponsors for the Learning Landscape. Um, without whom, whom we would not be able to, to have hosted this event. So they are the um, Heritage Council, um, the Environmental Protection Agency, Clare County Council, and indeed Galway County Council. Um, so I also am really fortunate to have my uh, colleague Prandley here as well with me today, and she's going to be help mo uh, moderating uh, this, the today's session. Um, we're going to do things a little bit differently. So it's a Zoom session, and normally I keep people's um, mics muted but we have a couple of activities today that I'm going to unmute the mics and uh, we, we encourage engagement um, and uh, chat and I'll let Shane kind of explain those as we go along. There will be points where I'll, where I'll centrally mute everyone's mics just for kind of the sake of smooth running etc. Um, so if after I just I'm going to introduce Shane first to you but I'm going to give you um, a few minutes just to get gather some pencil and paper so if you want to do that now I'm going to give you maybe until 11.07, just to gather a piece of paper and some pencils if you have them nearby. You might be like me sitting at your messy desk with thousands and thousands of pens, most of them not working. <laughs> Um, and so just just one other word as well, really, um, you know, uh, the Burn Bio Trust is, a, is a, a landscape charity. We're a registered charity and we have, um, you know, a couple of part time staff. We have, I think, six part time staff at this stage. Um, however, we, we run between us over 26 programs, um, including place based education that we that we run in various schools, primary schools and secondary schools. Um, and I suppose just to, to let you know that we would appreciate any um, support or uh, donations or even just becoming a member of, of the Burnbill Trust because our members are our community as well and it is it's a really important part and a huge kind of um, part of, of how we run. So without further ado I'll introduce Shane Casey. Shane is the author of four dyslexia friendly children's books and I was just saying to Shane as well that they're also the, the text is dyslexia friendly but actually I found just from my own young readers at home that it's actually just very friendly for little young uh, minds as well to kind of to read the text. Um, so his 
books are in, aimed at engaging children with the wildlife on their own doorstep and they're an accompanying support uh, material handbooks for teachers. Shane was a biodiversity officer for 10 years with, Care County, with County Care and Dublin City with focus on education and awareness and he is currently a Parks and Landscape Officer with Dublin City Council. Um, Shane's uh, presentation today is entitled Wildlife Writing and the Primary Curri Curriculum and his workshop will focus with on wildlife writing for children aged 6 to 12 and will offer a template writing workshop that can be adapted and delivered in schools and elsewhere. Um, Shane's workshop integrated into the primary curriculum, particularly on SESE and the primary language curriculum. Um, so without further ado, and I'm very excited myself, it's going to be very helpful and useful for me in my own practice, uh, Shane, and I'll let Shane uh, take it away from there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Grania. Um, hello and, and welcome everyone. Uh, it's my first kind of uh, online workshop. I've, I've had a number of these before, but they've always been in a physical room with physical people in front of me. So um, we'll see how this goes. Hopefully it, it'll be enjoyable. Um, what I want to, I suppose, deliver today is uh, if there's any teachers listening or heritage and schools specialist or, or parents who, who have young kids or young readers, um, to provide a template that can be, can be used by yourselves um, both in schools and at home as well. So I'm going to look to share my screen here and hopefully we'll get started. Okay. So the first thing I want to do, um, what I normally do in workshops is a couple of, of warm-up games. So I'm going to ask Ronnie to, to unmute everyone for, for a moment. Um, and this game, it's, it's an odd one out game. So it's simply I give three, three examples and you shout out what one's the argument out and why it is. Um, so the first one should be fairly simple. Um, fox, rabbit, daisy. So if there's anybody out there that, that knows the answer, you might just shout it out. So the, um, everyone has the ability to unmute themselves. So if everybody could unmute themselves uh, from their own things. Daisy. Yeah. Daisy. Daisy. <laughs> daisy. 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 <laughs> You're right, it is a daisy. A daisy is a flower, the others are animals. They, they get a bit harder. Otter, dog, badger? Dog. 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 Why? Uh, not wild. Domestic. <coughs> domestic. It's domesticated. Yeah, the other two are wild. Butterfly, bumblebee, mayfly? Mayfly. 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 Why is it a mayfly? Not One a pollinator. Day. Not pollinators, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. I was going to go with mayflies live in water, the other two don't. <laughs> yeah. right. uh, Hottie, Ash, you. Ash. Ash. Why Ash? It's not evergreen. Deciduous. Exactly. Swift, cuckoo, blackbird. Cuckoo. Cuckoo. Swift. Blackbird. 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 All answers there. <laughs> The, uh, the answer cuckoo doesn't is, raise its own. <laughs> yeah, you're right. The cuckoo doesn't raise its own chicks. But the swift and the cuckoo are both visitors to the island of the year, whereas the blackbird is, is resident. Uh, um, so in all the answers, there's, look, there's, there's often more than one answer. This is great for, particularly for older kids, and um, get a bit of critical thinking going on. Um, for younger classes, uh, we normally just do a, um, an alphabet game where you, you name out a plant or animal that begins with the, the first letter of, of the alphabet. Um, so it depends on the, the age groups you're, you're dealing with. Okay, um, so that's just to kind of get a quick start up. Now, I'm going to ask you then to get a pen and paper together. Um, ideally at this stage, we would bring you outside into the schoolyard or into the garden or out in the barn, preferably. Um, can, I, can I just um, interrupt you one section? Yes. I'm, go I'm going to um, I'm going to mute everyone century. Is that okay? Again. Yeah. Perfect. And I'm going to, yes, and you're, you're going to have to unmute yourself then at that point, as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully everybody can hear me again. Um. So ideally, you would bring. Your, your your class out into the uh, schoolyard or local landmark or wherever it is. Um, we can't right now because obviously this is, is virtual. So I'm going to do, try something, do something a little bit different. What I'm going to ask you to do is try to think 
at somewhere you've been. And if you have a pen and paper handy, just write it down. So if you've been to the seaside or a forest or a bog, and if you can keep it local, we're, we're talking about the learning landscapes and it's about learning from your local landscape. So if you can keep it local, I don't want a, a beach out in Lanzarote or anything like that. Keep it, keep it for north where I'm from if you can. If not, then give it to your own local area. So somewhere you've take it somewhere you've been. What did you see there? What colours? Um, what season were you were you there? Was it was it springtime or summertime or autumn? Because different habitats have different colours and different seasons. So, for example, trees at this time of year, their leaves are green. In autumn time, they're golden, brown, red, rusty, and so on. What did you hear? Was it early in the morning? Did you hear the dawn chorus? Was it uh, late in the evening? Did you hear the flutter of, of bats or, or moths? What did you smell? If you were in a woodland or a pine woodland, did you get that rich uh, pine smell? Or were you out in... Um, uh, a meadow, get kind of smell of fresh hay. Um, I always love to smell in, in early May of of white thorn. Um, uh, in Fenor, and it's still they the 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 smell of the blossoms just lifts in in early May, and it's absolutely wonderful. Um, what do you touch? Do you have any textures? This is great for kind of um, uh, encouraging kids to use their their senses because biodiversity appeals to all of our senses. You can you can hear it, smell it, touch it, taste it, and of course their body senses uh, are part of your your primary curriculum for for younger ages, and it also encourages uh, kids to start observing nature in a different way than than maybe they, they would normally. What were you doing there? Who you wish? How did you feel when you were there? Um, this kind of encourages recollection it kind of starts to get you into a bit of storytelling and um, it also kind of gets you into a, a bit of well-being and well-being is becoming a more and more important part of the, the primary curriculum um, and being out in nature and kind of reminiscing of, of how, how you're feeling it when you're when you're out there is is as part of that now if you look at the, what you've written down um, you actually probably have the basis of of a story there because what do you actually write about well you write about what you know and what we know most is our own experiences with our family with our friends with our pets and with our hobbies um, and we would always encourage kids that if you have a story that's good enough to tell a friend then you should write it down now i'm not going to focus too much into the the primary curriculum uh writing obviously has a key part to play in the language curriculum but because we're focusing on wildlife writing today I want to look at the SESE curriculum social environmental and scientific education and um, if there are teachers out there you'd be very familiar with, their, with this if, if they're not then um, there's a number of different strands in the SESE curriculum one is geography that looks at, at broader habitats one is environmental awareness and the other is, is, is uh, plant and animals so what I've done quickly here just to kind of give you a demonstration is pull out um, one of the strand units for the SE, SE curriculum, which is plants and animals. Now, I'm not going to go through this. The reason I'm bringing it up is that in a few moments' time, I'm going to read you a story from one of our books. And what I want to demonstrate is that a good story can be used at all uh, age ranges up through primary uh, school to, um, to, to, to deliver the objectives of the SEAC curriculum. Um, and if you can do this by reading a story, you can do it even better by by writing your own story. So this is the strand from the junior and senior infants. And at that age, the main focus is on observation, is on looking at common plants and, and animals and their, their basic uh, parts. As you move up to first and second class, you start exploring topics like hibernation and migration. And um, as you move on, you're getting more into um, why different groups of animals live in certain areas and how they interact with their 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 non uh, their natural environment, their uh, water, rocks, and so on. And you move further on into uh, sorry, this is a very small, but uh, it's the fifth and sixth class uh, curriculum, and it's more about the interrelationships between different plants and animals. And um, that's very briefly. And the reason I'm just uh, flying through it like that is that I'm going to read you a quick story. 
And what I want you to do uh, is keep an eye out for the different plants and animals that we've mentioned, um, their habitat, their, their feeding, their behavior, their characteristics and life cycles, um, and see how they fit into the different parts of the curriculum for uh, junior and senior infants in terms of observation into first and second class in terms of introducing concepts like hibernation and pollination and so on. Um, uh, um, third and fourth in terms of their interactions with their, their non-life uh, environments. Sorry, my, my language has gone awful today. And in fifth and sixth class for the interrelationships between different plants and animals. So I'm going to uh, exit share screen and share a different screen if I can. Uh, here we go. Okay, so it's a story about a young author on her first day in school. Um, now you'll notice that there's a, uh, an author in school with a, a salmon, and I've been told by a six-year-old in the past that that could never happen. Um, bear with me, give me a bit of poetic license with this. So, or this big day. Orla was very nervous. She was so nervous, she couldn't eat the delicious trout her mother caught her for breakfast. She even turned her, her nose up at the eels, her favourite breakfast dish. In fact, Orla was so nervous, she couldn't even enjoy her morning splash around in the water. Now. All otters are by their nature very shy and nervous creatures. But on this particular morning, Orla had good reason to be for extra nervous. You see, it was Orla's first day at school and the first time she was going to be away from her family. Poor Orla, she kept thinking, is the teacher going to be nice? Will I make any friends? And will I get lots of homework? Orla's mom did everything she could to ease Orla's nerves. She gave her a big hug and asked her to be a brave girl. She even promised to collect Orla at the end of the school and bring her for a special treat. So Orla took a deep breath and put on her bravest face. Orla's school was on a river bank, not far from the hold where she lived with her family. Her classroom was under an old willow tree which overhung the river. Oh, it was magical. Its branches lazily broke the surface of the water sending tiny ripples downstream. The leaves sang an enchanted duet with a gentle breeze, and as the sun rose above the horizon each morning, it cast a shimmering shadow on the water. Orla was still looking around in awe when a friendly little duckling waddled over to her. Would you like to play a game with us, quacked the little duckling. Orla loved playing games, and very soon she had forgotten all about her nerves and had made lots of new friends. Orla's teacher was Mrs. Teal. She was a kind old duck who spent much of her time visiting friends and relatives in Iceland and Russia. Mrs. Teal constantly waddled over and back across the front of the classroom, recounting the many adventures she had had as a young duck. She told stories about migrating across the world and the lessons she had learned along the way. And occasionally, she got a fit of spontaneous quacking in the middle of her lesson, which brought giggles to all her students. But Mrs. T was also a very wise duck. On that first day, she held out a tiny acorn in her wing and said, from this little acorn, a mighty oak will grow. Then she smiled at her class and said, now my little acorns, tell me what you'd like to be when you grow up. Millie, the little duckling who had asked Orla to play, was the first one to answer. Millie certainly wasn't short on confidence. I'm going to be the greatest married duck of all time. And when I grow up, I'm going to fly all over the world. That's nothing, said Simon, a young salmon. When I grow up, I'm going to leave this room and swim across the North Atlantic Ocean. Then, when I'm older, I'm going to return to this same river and raise a family, just like my parents and grandparents did. When we grow up, we're going to grow legs and become frogs, chanted a dozen tiny tadpoles. Then we'll climb out of the water, live on the land and breathe air. Well, when I grow up, I'm going to leave this river as well, said Mary, a tiny mayfly larva. 
I'm going to swim to the surface of the river, grow long, beautiful wings and fly away. So each child got their chance to answer Mrs. Teal's question. Every answer was more amazing than the last and brought gasps of awe from everybody. Finally, it was Orla's turn. Orla had never thought about this before and she'd always been too busy having fun and playing games. I could be an Olympic swimmer, answered Orla, or catch the world's biggest trout. On the other hand, I just love playing in the water, so maybe I'll join the circus. At this, all the children in the class giggled, including Mrs. Teal. I think you'll be a very popular circus performer and make a lot of people laugh and smile, said Mrs. Teal. Well, said Orla, I hope that I can still have fun with my friends when I grow up, but right now, I'm just happy being me. That's a fantastic idea, Orla, said Mrs. Teal, who did announce it was high time they all had a little more fun. So the rest of the day was spent playing games and having fun. Before she knew it, Orla's first day of school had come to an end. And no, there was no homework that first day either. The end. And I hope you enjoy that. And um, normally, after reading a story like that, we would um, ask the kids what kind of animal is the, the main character, what's the eat, where does it live, and so on. Um, basic questions that uh, are good for more junior classes. And then we get into kind of some higher order questions for um, the, the older classes. Why do you think the, the habitat is such a popular home for different animals, or why do you think these animals choose to live in this habitat? Um, so what I want to demonstrate in that is that you, by using a good story, you can use it at junior inference right up to, to sixth class. Um, it's just the depth of your, your questioning afterwards uh, deepens a little bit. You can also have a little bit of fun. Um, particularly in, in uh, I find with uh, first and second class, um, if humans or your pet could metamorphosize, what changes do you think might happen? Um, would you go wings and fly away, or would you go gills or to swim underwater, or, or extra limbs, or acquire new senses? Um, so it's, a, it's amazing some of the answers you, you get when you, when you ask a question like that. I won't ask it today, but um, give it a go when you um, try it yourselves. Uh, just for your own information, um, we've had huge feedback from teachers over the last, we, we published the book, first book in 2013, so seven years. Um, we've collated all those uh, feedback and advice into a teacher's handbook, which is um, our support materials for teachers, more, more importantly, um, which is a very useful uh, resource, which is a free download from our, our website. Um, whether you're using the books or, or not, you'll find it very useful when you're visiting schools. So now I want you to get writing your own story. Um, where do you begin? Well. I always begin with uh, who is my main character. Um, and sometimes you have to, to research this. Um, uh, we all know the common plants and animals, hedgehogs and otters and bumblebees and so forth, but um, you need to get a more rounded uh, view on your, on your main character. So you need to do a bit of research. And when I start a story, I, I first of all decide which animal or plant I wanted to write about. Then I research as much as I can about it so I get a, a more holistic um, understanding of, of that character and their, their behaviours and so forth. And you also have to remember that um, when you're writing a story or telling a story, that your readers can't see the pictures in your, in your head. So I might have a picture of what a character looks like in my head, but until I explain what, what they look like to you, um, yeah, you, you won't know. And at this stage, you don't want to give too much information um, in the, the story of, of Orla. Um, there was no physical description of Orla, but you knew at, at the end of the story that uh, otters are very shy creatures, they're very playful creatures, they love playing in the water. You, you know what they, they eat, the, the trout and the eels. Um, but it didn't come out and say, this is what otters do and this is what they, they look like and so on. Um, so you have to try to uh, 
introduce your characters in a kind of subtle way that lets your readers know uh, a little bit about them. So I'm just going to give you a couple of examples from, from our own books. Um, uh, Queen Hannah was a beautiful bumblebee with a golden crown on her head and a golden sash around her waist. But what really made her stand out from the crowd was her sandy colored tail. Now, anyone who goes uh, identifying bumblebees will know that they, it's the tail that you look at and the different colored tails, it's different um, bumblebees. That's actually from a story called The Life of Bombus Riley. And Bombus, people would be familiar with, is actually the, the family name of, of bumblebees. The next one down, the little fox. Vinton was quite a handsome young cub. He had bright little eyes that peered out from beneath a red fur coat. His long bushy tail was tipped in black and he wore matching black stockings. But there was something else that made Vinton stand out. So it's a kind of, um, I, I love writing about young animals because they're, uh, they're very cuddly and you can also, almost imagine that they're um, a, a little teddy bear. Um, if we move over to uh, the, the hedgehog, there's no physical description of the hedgehog in the story because most people recognize what a hedgehog is. So the description here is, Hazel was without a doubt the most beautiful hedgehog he had ever seen with deep brown eyes that were filled with mischief. So it gives a sense of her, her personality. And the last one, Dean, has got a little uh, pygmy shoe. Sheridan was, wasn't the most handsome of shoes. He wasn't the most intelligent shoe or the funniest shoe, unless he found funny looking. No, Sheridan was just an ordinary little pygmy shoe with twitching ears, a sniffling nose and squinty eyes. Indeed, Sheridan was the last pygmy shoe you'd ever expect something amazing to happen to. That was all about to change. So it's, it's, it's introducing characters in, in different ways. So what I normally do is I have these pictures uh, printed out and laminated. And if I go into a class, I normally give a picture, one each to, to uh, different students or one in pairs. And what I ask them to do and what I'm going to ask you to do now, and I'm going to give you about a minute to do it, is give your character a name, because the name is very important. Uh, give them two physical characteristics and one personality trait and one thing that makes them stand out. And what we're going to ask you to do is if we have a, a, maybe two or three volunteers to give back their, their answers, um, we'll ask Grania um, to unmute you to, to give back your, your answers in, in about a minute. Um, what you would expect from younger classes, uh, juniors, senior infants, that um, it's, it's very black and white, that Badger has a black and white stripe on, on his face uh, small ears and, and a big uh, dark nose um, what you might expect from older classes is something a little bit more creative so you can choose whether you want to write about uh, a little badger a signet, a field mouse or a frog, I'm going to give you a minute to do it um, like I say, give them a name give them uh, two physical characteristics, one personality trait and one thing that makes them stand out Okay. so your minute starts now and we're, after that we're going to get Grani to uh, Look for maybe two or three volunteers just to give uh, a bit of uh, feedback to the, the group. Like I say, when I go around to schools and different groups, I, I have pictures printed out on A4 size and I um, hand them around to the kids. And it's a great little um, resource to prompt kids to do it. Um, and go in and just ask kids to start writing. It's, uh, it's a bit difficult, but if you give them a, a prompt, it's, it's a real benefit. Okay, so about 30 seconds left and they will, uh, if there's a, a couple of volunteers, just to, to, to call out. Shane, just to repeat, it's two physical characteristics and one personality trait, is that right? That's or, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, your character needs personality and I'm always kind of careful not to over-personify animals. Um, when you read one of the stories or one of our stories, um, you should have a sense of what the animal looks like, their, their behaviours, um, their, their natural habitats. I am not a fan of writing about uh, animals that are overly personified. None of them stand upright, they don't wear clothes. They, I know I've 
a bit of leeway in terms of, of a little bit of talking in, in some of our stories, uh, but in general, animals don't, don't uh, talk in, in English language, um, but certainly mm -hmm. they, they, they're not standing upright or dressed in clothes. Um, think Beatrix Potter without the clothes and um, get close enough to it. Okay, so we do have um, one or two volunteers that are, would like to give a name and a, a couple of, of traits. So you can you can put your hands up if you if you feel like volunteering. By the way, in a normal situation, uh, I wouldn't be asking for volunteers. Everybody would have to do it. <laughs> Una, am I seeing you? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, you can unmute yourself now. I'm struggling on the personality as far as the physical characteristics. Um, uh, Phyllis, um, I'm sorry, what was that? I can't even read my own writing. Um, Phyllis looked like your typical frog with bulbous eyes and skin which changed colour with her surroundings, um, I suppose, but Phyllis loved adventure. Lovely. That's, Brilliant. A, that's a fantastic name for a frog, by the way, Phyllis. <laughs> Do we have any more? Any more volunteers? I think David Eager there will be unmuted. Yep, right, hello. Yep, great. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure if I had to choose just one of those four you showed, but anyway, I went for something else, which was a coot, because there's a lake okay. where I am. Yeah, and they've and there's um, there are uh, two or three pairs of of adults, and there are some little ones. So a baby coot called Hootie. Um, gray, gray, we're, we're gray and fluffy, and uh, we have strong beaks um, and great legs for moving around. It's just wonderful, and we are courageous. Lovely, very good. Thank you. I think Susan Green there has uh, sent a lovely message in the chat. Would she like to talk? Tell us. Can't find her in the. Wait, I'm trying to find her now. I can't see her in the... Uh, oh yeah, I see her now. Um, okay. Susan, did you get my message too? Yeah, cool. Yes, I have it now, thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, I, I went um, with a very handsome looking frog there. Fernando Frog had exceptional eyes, powerful legs, and the widest smile. He could swim a mile. <laughs> I write poetry most of the time, so. <laughs> That's beautiful. Nice. That's, That's fab. fantastic. Fabulous. Anyone else want to have a go? Sinead Walsh, I'm going to unmute you now. I think I see Neve as well. Neve, maybe you can go next after her. So, uh, my, my daughter, uh, I'm very busy but Poetry has only three legs. He has two black stripes, one over each eye, tiny black eyes. Wow, lovely. Niamh, do you lovely. want to go next? Yeah. Um, uh, Brooke, the baby badger, um, in his black and white suit and brown nose, very brave, loves to explore for insects. I, I really love the, the fact that he's uh, in a suit. I think that's, um, that's lovely. I can, I can actually see it right now. Um, I, like, I like the use of the Irish as well, Neil. The Brook. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> great, great name. Thank Very you. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, we're going to, to, to move on, but just a kind of a, a reminder, um, when, you're, when you're doing this with, with, with kids in particular, um, pictures of baby animals, I find go down very well. But I do it with adults, and I do do it with adults. I um I include kind of things like uh, curlews and uh, seals, animals that are kind of um uh, endangered or uh, uh, rare, just to kind of get there's an extra message that comes out of that as well. Um, it's just kind of explore those uh, species. So uh, for for younger kids, pictures like these for for adults in uh, kind of try to add in an extra element to the to the workshop. Okay, 
So you've got your character, now you need to know where your story is set. So I'm going to just give you a, a quick example of a story about um, a young song thrush that keeps drumming up his notes every time he sings a song and where that story is set. So starting on the second paragraph there. Tara lived in a hedge at the end of a little garden, a hedge full of hawthorn that exploded in white blossoms every spring and juicy red haws every autumn. It was a hedge full of activity, pygmy shoes and rabbits hid in the undergrowth, while caterpillars and shield bugs crawled among the leaves. Um, it's important when you're uh, writing about habitats to, to recognise that they're, they're alive. They're not an inanimate building like I'm sitting in right now. They're, they're dynamic and they change from season to season. In a hedgerow, the undergrowth is very different from the canopy. Um, it's a very different hedgerow in, in the spring rather than the, the autumn and so on. Um, you have some animals that live their entire lives in the hedge and others that are just passing through. So kind of the transient nature of, of animals. Um, your, your habitat or your setting for your story can be in a ditch, um, something that small, or it can be in a, in a wide open farm landscape like the, like the farm. Um, this is a, just one more. Um, yesterday was a magical place where the river met the sea and its train skips. The sea would bring golden grains of sand while the river carried little sediments of silt. Then the swirling waters mixed the sand and silt together to create great expanses of mud flats. And hidden in the nutrient rich mud, there was a thriving community of curious creatures. Now, anyone who has um, had to explain to geography about estuaries might find that a, a slightly different way of explaining what an estuary is, but equally it, um, it, it fits in very well with the geography as, as much as it does with the plants and animals and, and so on. So what I'm going to ask you to do this time, and again, I'm going to give you a minute to do it. Um, I again have these pictures laminated and I bring them with me. What I try to do, um, and it's not always necessary, but what I try to do is I have a, a number on the back of my animal and a number on the back of the habitat that the animal lives in that habitat. So you're linking your setting back to your, your main character. Um, so pygmy shoe in a, in a garden or an otter beside a river. Um, you don't really have a puffin in, in woodlands because puffins don't live in woodlands. Um, it, when it comes to adults, I can sometimes mix it up, but for, for kids in particular, uh, if you can link the habitat or your setting to the animals that, you're, that you've previously talked about. So I'm going to give you one minute. Um, again, choose whichever picture you want or any other picture. Uh, give me a seasonal colour, the sounds or smells. And why is your character there? Um, and that's particularly important for, for older classes. Are they there? Uh, looking for food or looking for shelter, um, looking for a mate, or they, are they lost? Uh, sometimes animals can, can get lost and end up somewhere that they, you wouldn't expect to, to find them. Um, so I'm going to give you one minute again just to come up with a seasonal colour or sound or smell and, and why your character is there. And I always encourage people to take up their senses, go back to the, to the first story I asked you to do, where, where, uh, where you remembered, um, what could you see, smell, touch, hear, taste. Again, for tuna classes, normally what you might get back is um, there were trees, the grass was green, there was a river. Uh, for older classes, you start getting a little bit more creative. You start finding out that rather than just a river, the river was winding its way through the different the, through the trees. Right, I'm going to give you 20 more seconds and then I'm going to ask Ronnie to um, look for maybe two or three more volunteers and uh, see what you come up with. I'm on the prowl. On the prowl, excellent. Through the... Everyone's busy, heads down, working at the moment. When I when I go when I used to to go around to give talks on biodiversity to um, 
to schools or libraries. I is always compare uh, napweed, uh, napweed you find on the side of a road to to a landscape like the, the barn because in napweed you have, I think it's about 14 different insects live on the different parts of the, the napweed from the roots right up to the, the flower head. So your habitat could be the size of a, of a napweed or a flower, whereas it could be the size of a river or woodland or um, an estuary. So it's always interesting to see what, uh, what comes back from these. Okay, so if there's a, uh, one or two volunteers. Do we have any volunteers? Again, I wouldn't ask for volunteers. Everybody would have to, to feed back on their normal circumstances. I'm trying to see, Capranja, you're looking as well. Uh, Veronica Brown is looking. Okay. I think we'll go with Goska next. I, she she sent a message in chat, so I'll unmute you now. Um, Veronica's, Veronica. yeah, yeah. Veronica's on now. Yeah. Veronica, uh, Tibble's the, um, the field mouse. Lives in a wildflower meadow. Wildflowers, yellow, blue, uh, green grass, the buttercups, the daisies, the bird's food trefoil. The uh, sounds of the breeze rustling through the grasses, rippling and the smells of the warm moon hay smell, warm in summer, and then more bleak in winter. Lovely. Mm -hmm. um, Brilliant, uh, Veronica. That, that's lovely, Veronica. And it kind of reminds me of something that, um, I, I'm about six foot, so, and when I go out in nature, I've kind of seen a lot of things before, but I'm seeing it at a certain height, um, so I kind of miss things that are down at the, the ground level. Whereas when I go out, I have a two, little, two and a half year old at the minute um, uh, and he sees things that I haven't seen for years. So it's always good to get uh, to lower your perspective right down to floor level to see what a child will see or see what an insect or a little um, like Tibble or a little wood mouse would, would see. And it's a very different world down there than it is at, as I am sitting six feet in the air. Gosta, um, do you want to go next? Uh, okay, I also wrote about the wood mouse uh, no. called Woody. Woody. And so, uh, wood, Woody's home was burrowed under an old log in a forest near the stream among brown fallen leaves. But when he woke up this evening, the log was gone. I am. Um, I'm looking forward to the next part of the story, and it's going to come up <laughs> now in a moment. Um, that's that's lovely. Okay, do we have one more volunteer and then we'll, we'll get the next bit? Carol, I think Carol Lewis, would you like to go? Um, on a foggy morning, silently blue the heron stands at the edge of the river, at, just beyond the bridge, um, waiting, well, I got this, <laughs> stands at the edge of the river, just beyond the bridge, waiting for a breakfast of minnows. Lovely. Very good. Okay. Um, we're going to move on now to the next part, because you, you now have your main character and you have where your story is set. So what happens next, the, the middle part of your story, and that's, that's the adventure. And this is where it's a little bit harder to give you prompts, but I'm going to, to try so I'm going to ask you, you have your character and your setting, what happens next? Um, who did I meet? Is it a friend or a foe and what did I do? So in the case of, of Woody, that is, he wakes up and his, um, his log is gone. Uh, what's going to happen next? I, I normally try to give an example of um, uh, a hedgehog that walks into the uh, forest and he meets a fox. And the fox looks very hungry. And if, uh, the hedgehog has to, to figure out what's he going to do to avoid getting eaten. Now you probably know what the answer is going to be, but that's the end of the story. And um, this is the middle bit. So for your next challenge, one minute again, is take your, your main character and a setting. What happens next? Who did I meet? What did I do? And who does what? Um, just a couple of things to keep in mind when you're doing that. Uh, your action words are important. So if you take a simple sentence like the man walked down the street and you change the action word, the man ambled down the street means he's kind of taken it easy, he's kind of relaxed. The man stumbled down the street, is he hurt? Is he drunk? 
um, the band Skip down the street. Is he happy? Is he excited? Um, why, why, why is he skipping? The man snuck down the street. Uh, is he scared? Is he hiding from someone? Or the man darted down the street. You see, it's most obviously in a hurry. Um, your action words are quite important when you're, when you're writing stories. For younger classes, your basic your man walk down the street, it's, it's fine. Um, but for fifth and sixth class, you look at different um, action words. Also, when you're an adult, write for a child, be conscious of your, uh, your language. It's, it's important to include words that are new to kids, but you don't want to include too many new words on, on every page. I am terrible, I, I write very long descriptive sentences with lots of big words and I need to cut them out uh, every so often. Um, but if you're getting more than two or three words per page that are new to a child, that kind of can put them off. So while it's important to include these words, it's also important to just kind of um, limit how many new words there are in, in each page. Um, so you have one minute to tell me what happens to your main character? Where did they go? What happens to them? Who did they meet? Uh, who, what, why, where and when? Um, that's the, the adventure part of it. It doesn't have to be spectacular. Um, they can go and meet a friend and, and play games and that's perfectly fine. Uh, they go and have a cup of tea. One of the, the, the best stories, actually there are two link stories, there are two sisters that were doing one of my workshops. One of them was writing about a unicorn another one was, was writing about uh, a pony and the pony went to magical unicorn land and uh, played uh, chase in the unicorn fields and then went for he and uh, of hay in the unicorn stables and had a seat over and her sister wrote the exact same story but from, from the perspective of the unicorn so it doesn't have to be wild or exciting it just um, uh, needs to, to move the story forward particularly when you're when you're dealing with, with younger kids, what you want to encourage is to, to get them to write, to write anything and everything. Because the more you write, the, the more experience you build up and the easier it is to kind of develop storylines as you, as you get older. Okay, so I'm going to give you another 30 seconds and then we're going to ask Ryan to look for another volunteer or two. Okay, do we have any volunteers, Grania? Um, Dean Eaton, would you like to do? Dean? You're on mute still, Dean. Um, you, here we go. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Thanks very much, Shane. Great so far. Um, so, just as Hector was about to pounce, Robbie, the bravest of Robins, alighted on a branch beside Hector, shouting at the top of his lungs, Don't jump! Don't jump! Simon Spratt's my friend. We meet here every day. That's it. <laughs> and then it'll go somewhere else, obviously. Very good. Um, I wonder what the, the end going to be. Uh, very good, Dean. You can't leave us there, Dean. No. <laughs> okay. Any, any other volunteers? If we can't see you, maybe send a message in chat. Sometimes we can't see your video and you're raising your hand. Patricia McKee, maybe. Yeah. Can you read for us? Can you see Patricia? Yeah. I think I've asked her to join mute. Mm -hmm. Cool. Lovely. Uh, Ducky the Duck discovered she loved paddling her feet. The more she moved them up and down, the farther she went. Out, out, out. Lovely. <laughs> It's a great sense to um, that, that story of what happens under the water on the top is, looks peaceful and underneath looks yeah. it's, uh, far from peaceful. Very also, nice. the ice, also, I think the repetition of the, the out, it really out, adds yeah. something, doesn't it? 
Yeah, I'm wondering where she's going out. So. <laughs> <laughs> and we might finish with um, David, maybe David Eager again. Okay. Just unmute yourself, David. Still with the frog. And the uh, frog's uh, dad says, says to her or he, uh, jump to it. Uh, today it's sports day. <laughs> uh, off, off goes the frog. And when uh, it, it, back at home afterwards, well, how did it go? Well, I found the, uh, the egg and spoon really quite difficult. Um, it kept falling off. I couldn't keep it on the, 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 the egg on the spoon. And then the sack race, I got really tangled up in that and all the other, the other animals, they were ahead of me. Um, so, uh, and then there was the, the awards. Mm, well, I hadn't done very well, so I didn't get a cup or anything. Oh, that's it. Oh dear. Very good. I bet you did very good on the long jump though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now that's, that's the, the middle. So we're gonna move on now to the, the end. Um, how does Steve Fincher end? Which character is the hero? Does everyone live happily ever after? Usually in a children's story, everybody lives happily ever after, to, to be honest. Um, so I'm going to give you one more minute to kind of come up with your, your ending. Some of them are uh, probably fairly obvious uh, endings, depending on the, the characters you have. When you're dealing with, with wildlife, um, most wildlife are looking for food, they're looking for mate or looking for shelter so the endings kind of write themselves a, a lot of the times um similarly within in, you'll notice in a lot of children's stories and I, i'm reading a lot of them at the minute because like i say i have a two and a half year old um that the storylines are are simple but you're you're linking to what kids are experiencing themselves so your sports day or your first day in school um are going on a playing games with your with friends or sleepover and so on. Um, so you've got one minute to start, how does your adventure end? Which character is the, the hero? Does everyone live happily ever after? And if it ends that they play games and then they went off for a cup of tea uh, and lived happily ever after, at this stage, it's it's fine. Because like, like I say, what you want to encourage is children to write and write anything because the more they write, the, the stronger their sword lines be, be, become. Um, I, I started writing when, when I was young and I still have some of the notes and I look back and they're, they're terrible. Um, but that's because I was young and I was only learning um, and you keep practicing. Uh, writing is a skill, same as reading, that you need to practice over and over again and you hopefully improve over time. Um, so you encourage, encourage the kids to write, write anything. So I'm going to give another 20 seconds and then Grani might look and Frangeli might look for um, one or two more volunteers to, to finish up. Okay, so if we have any volunteers. I'm kind of curious to know um, where that little duck was paddling out to <laughs> and what happened to Robbie, the little robin. Me too. Has anyone finished? Dean? <laughs> um, I know it's, it's a bit cruel to only give you one minute to, to do this with, with very little practice in advance um, uh, and it's it's difficult when you're visiting a, a school and doing a workshop like this because you, you only have a limited amount of time a uh, little bit more of an advantage when, when you're actually there full time like a, like a teacher normally would be. Yeah. Um, would Mary Paul be interested in that uh, because we didn't give give her a chance earlier. Um, let me find her now. Um, can't see your video, but I saw, I saw the chat message. Marie, would you like to talk? Oscar is also ready. Okay, Una. I just asked. 
So everybody still writing? Oh, yeah. or, uh, <laughs> I think uh, Una, Una Halpin yeah. is, wants to say something. Already, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so, so the story so far, Phyllis has been staring into the pond, thinking about the tadpole she's going to have in the future. And the heron arrived. So now the last bit. Um, Phyllis froze for a second. If she kept very still, maybe she wouldn't be seen. But it was scary being out in the open. She should have remained hidden. Just then, a splash, and the heron flew away with a fish in her mouth, saved for another day. Brilliant. Uh, good. It, uh, it's, a lovely, it's a lovely way of uh, um, the, the terror that must be for uh, a young frog uh, and the prospect of being eaten by, by a heron. Um, it's lovely. Thank you. Susan Graham, would you like to go next? Yes, there, there I am. Uh, uh, just, if it's okay, go from the beginning, I'll read fast. So Fernando Frog had exceptional eyes, powerful legs and the widest smile. He, he could swim a mile. Born in a river, a sticky little blob miraculously grew, becoming a frog. The river was wide and had travelled far, rippling and splashing, carving a path. A heron appeared up on the bank, scaring Fernando, making him plank. What should he do? He asked his friend Frank. There's a hole in the bank. Let's hide in there. We will be safe. No longer scared. Fantastic. Wow. That's, that's, um, feel a bit uh, humble now listening to a <laughs> fantastic poet. Right? Thank you very much for that. That's great. You're welcome. Uh, that's Mark really great. Le Mark Levelin, next. I don't really want to follow that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is um, this is the follow-on from the last part, but I didn't finish in time. But um, Brooke the Badger watched the sun come up before he went to bed and thought about everything he had learned about earthworms. Sure, they were great for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but they were so important to everything he knew, all life in the wood and beyond. Yeah, that's it. Very good. Thank you. Okay, wow. so we're going to um, wrap will we, it up. Will we go with one last one? Because Dean said he's happy to share, and I think we'd like yeah, to hear more. Yeah. Well, Robbie, yeah, go for it. Okay, we'll give it a go. So, um, <laughs> Hector liked Robbie's spirit. How could he refuse? What do you talk about, queried Hector? Simon tells stories of the river fast, and I tell stories of the diggers in the allotment. What stories could you share, asked Robbie. From that day on, Hector visited the riverbank every day and shared stories of his hunting exploits and his flight. Very good. Thank you, Dean. That, that, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, thanks to everyone who, who shared um, stories. It's, it's, kind of, it's a relief, to be honest with you. I was kind of worried that um, because it's virtual, um, in, in, a, in a physical room I can point them out and uh, <laughs> Get them to, to speak up, but in a virtual room. So, thank you to everyone who contributed. That's fantastic. So, a few final tips maybe um, read everything, um, listen to how people talk. I'm a big believer in, in that particular one. And, and from North Clare, and there's a lovely kind of soft way of, of speaking in, in, in North Clare in particular. Uh, the, way, the way complicated things are, are phrased very simply. So, listen to how people talk, write. Anything, like I say, if you have a story that's good enough to tell the wind, you should write it down. Uh, because the more you write, the more practice you get and the, the better you, you get at it. And finally, get out and do stuff. Um, that's the most important thing, get out in nature and start looking at it in a different way. Try to remember that it appeals to, to all your, your five senses. Um, it's not just what you, can, what you can see, but what you can hear and taste and touch as well. Um, and how it changes uh, from season to season. So thank you very much. I hope you found that uh, helpful. Uh, and I hope I have encouraged, I know there's some fantastic writers and poets out there already, um, but maybe there might be a few more after, after this. And it's a useful template to bring around and deliver in schools or uh, libraries. Or if you're a parent and you have young kids, you can try to deliver it yourself. So best of luck with it. And thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure if there are any questions after that, but if there are, please let me know. Um, and once again, thank you. I'm actually, I'm just so blown away by that, Shane. It was brilliant. I really enjoyed it. And I think it was great engagement, great participation. And we haven't had such an engaged um, uh, Zoom workshop. So I, uh, I was nervous, but it, I think it went really well. Um, 
I, we don't actually have very much time for questions. So what I'd encourage you to do is put them into the chat box here and I'll be able to harvest them and put them to Shane. And we could possibly um, address them at a later date, if that's okay, maybe even, uh, I don't know, we could do like a, a, an email with some, some responses from Shane. I've included your, um, a link to, your, to the teacher's handbook in the chat, I put it in a few times. And also, um, and that's your, your website as well, shanecaseybooks.ie. Um, so thank you so much. Um, at 12.30, we're coming back with uh, Des Murta and Paddy Madden, and I'd encourage you to, to join in uh, for a further discussion on the nature in the primary curriculum. Um, so thanks a million, Shane. Thanks, Prenchley, for helping me. Um, and thanks, everybody, for being so tech savvy and engaged. It was really great. Um, I will leave it with that. I'm actually going to end this meeting, however, and I'm going to put a quick poll up as I've done every day just to kind of get feedback. Um, so I'll launch that now. But however, I will end this meeting momentarily and then restart it at 12.30 for, for the next session. Thanks very much, Shane. And I hope we get to have you in real life at Learning Landscapes Symposium soon doing this. Hopefully soon. I would love to do this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Thank you.